After compiling the best record in team history despite a series of setbacks, Chuck Knotts' Seahawks found themselves battling the Miami Dolphins in postseason play for the second straight year. One half, Seattle held back the record-setting offensive power of the Dolphins and kept the game within reach. But in the end, the Seahawks fell to the eventual conference champions 31 to 10. Never in team history had a final game so profoundly failed to capture the essence of a Seahawks season. This had been the greatest year in franchise history and it had been achieved against substantial odds. It began under the summer skies of Canton, Ohio, where football legend Paul Brown awarded the game's highest honor to one of the Seahawks' own. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you a presentation to the Hall of Fame, my guy, Michael McCormick. While Seattle's general manager was being enshrined, the team he had helped put together was preparing itself in training camp. Fresh from their first playoff appearance, the Seahawks were anxious to repeat. And the man who would once again carry much of the workload would be conference rushing champion, Kurt Warner. This year, it's a different approach. Uh, I feel like one of the boys. Uh, I feel like uh, this is my home. I know the system. I know what Chuck Knox expects from me. I know what I have to do out there, and I feel very comfortable this year as opposed to last year. With Warner leading the way, the Seahawks began the year against the Browns in quest of their first opening day win in team history. The defense recorded seven sacks, and quarterback Dave Craig threw three touchdown passes as Seattle crushed Cleveland 33 to nothing. This should have been the Seahawks' happiest opening game ever. Instead, it turned into a gut-wrenching nightmare. Wing back set off the tight end at the right. They go to Warner on a pitch right. He's got some blocking. Now cuts it down to the five, and down he goes at a four-yard line. Oh, Pete, he's hurt. He's hurt. He's holding he, that right knee. He pulled up as he was making his cut, and his yep. leg just went limp on him. Oh, my, you hate to see that. Dave Craig is over there with the Seahawks oh. medical staff. Oh, my. Isn't this something? Do you lose Kurt Warner in the very first ball game? Oh, if you do, you're in big, big trouble. The absence of Kurt Warner would in no way ever be an excuse for us not to win. Because, number one, Kurt Warner did not play on defense. He did not play on special teams. It was a big, important part of our offense. So what we had to do was to find some other people that could together, collectively, take up the productivity that was going to be missing with Kurt Warner out of the lineup. Whether it was the quiet leadership of Franco Harris or the slashing style of Dan Dorning, Seattle's other runners were ready for the challenge. Along with David Hughes, Zach Dixon, Randall Morris, Eric Lane, and Cullen Bryant, the Seattle backs bought valuable time for Chuck Knox, allowing him to change his run-oriented offense to a passing one. All the strategy that had been formed in training camp had to be revised, but through this difficult period of adjustment, the team hung together and the Seahawks kept right on winning. I was sorry that Kurt was hurt, but it was an opportunity for me to, to play some offense. But I still wanted to play special teams, too. Um, it was more like uh, I have double duty now. Lane captained the most feared special teams in pro football. 
Running under Jeff West's punts, this swarming horde found even more ways for the Seahawks to win. They forced the most turnovers, blocked the most kicks, and before Paul Johns, number 85, was lost for the season, Seattle led the conference in punt returns as well. Where once gadget plays had flourished, the Suicide Squad's calling card was now the bone-jarring hit. Leading the charge was the first man ever selected to the Pro Bowl strictly for special teams play, number 50, Fred Young. Williams at the one yard line, kids up the middle behind the wedge. The 50 oh. is he written down, he really got close line. In 1984, the Seahawks fielded their best defensive unit in team history. Records and ball carriers tumbled in equal measure as Seattle transformed its defense from pushover to powerhouse. The personnel was basically unchanged from previous years, but there were several reasons why this year's model was among the finest in football. I think it's just a, a confidence that we have just from being comfortable with the coaching staff, with our role on the football team, and knowing that we have the ability to stop anybody. We're not a, a big bunch of guys, but, uh, you know, we play with pride and we play with hustle and, uh, you know, we just let it all hang out. Seattle's defense featured the three-man front of Jacob Green and Jeff Bryant, flanking nose man Joe Nash. From this trio, there was unleashed one of the fiercest pass rushes in the NFL. I think it has to do with just us playing together as a unit for the last two years in 3-4. And I think that helps out a lot because you get to know the players next year. You know what they can do, and you know how to compensate for certain things that they do. So I think we work really well as a team. The three of us ha have gotten used to uh, going against two people. We know we're gonna, one of us is gonna get two sometimes, and whoever has one man to beat, then that's the guy that's gotta get there, get into the quarterback. That's what a defensive end or a defensive lineman is supposed to do. Green and Bryant exploded from the outside and all-pro nose tackle Nash stormed through the middle to give Seattle a decided advantage in the game of quarterback pursuit. When a four-man front added Mike Fanning, number 74, Seattle's line was even more imposing and just as intent on achieving its goals. We play with heart. You know, we really want to get the job done. We know it starts up front. And in order to be successful, we're going to have to keep going every play, play each play like it's the last play, and make things happen. Also making things happen was the Seahawk linebacking core of Shelton Robinson, Keith Butler, Greg Gaines, and Bruce Schultz. In Seattle's defensive scheme, the linebackers are supposed to make most of the tackles. Such instructions were carried out to the letter. Seattle wasn't reluctant to send a defensive back in on a tackle either. Blitz with a Harris, Dufek or Brown. Shoot in a Moyer, Simpson, Jackson or Taylor. Or better yet, simply take the ball away. The Seahawks forced 38 interceptions and 63 turnovers, by far the most in the NFL and the second highest total in league history. While the offense was still making fundamental changes after Kurt Warner's injury, the defense was doing some scoring of its own. Combining with the special teams, Seattle's defense scored or set up 188 points. In a year when such contributions made an enormous impact, 
one athlete in particular eclipsed the feats of every other defensive player in the NFL. On, on behalf of what Kenny Easley has done for us as a team and as a man, I'd like to present him with this game ball. In 1984, Kenny Easley danced well ahead of the pack in pro football's elite. Postseason honors had come before to the Seahawks' safety, but this year, Easley became the dominant defensive player in football. He exuded star-like quality, yet was not too big to perform the dirty jobs that are necessary to winning. When Kenny Easley volunteered to return punts after Paul Johns went down, it was the first time in the 31 years that I've been coaching that I've ever ha had a starter volunteer to return punts. That's not a job that people line up to want to do. With this unselfish act, Easley set an example that his teammates never forgot. My attitude on the football field is that, that I want to win very badly, and I'm willing to pay the price to win and do whatever it takes to win for our football team. So I want to enjoy myself and have a lot of fun out there and do the things that I do best, and that's run and hit and make big plays. Easley made an abundance of big plays, including a league-leading 10 interceptions. He was a unanimous Pro Bowl pick, an All-Pro selection, and NFL Defensive Player of the Year. It was Easley, along with the rest of the defense, who sparked a mid-season streak against division opponents that all but clinched a playoff berth. The first win came before a Monday night television audience in San Diego. Easley swiped three interceptions as the Seahawks shut out the explosive charges 24 to nothing. The next week, against the Chiefs, pro bowler Dave Brown was the designated star. Single back set, Kenny's back to pass, shoots one toward the left side, and is picked off by Brown up the sideline, he goes! He couldn't go all the way, he's gonna go all the way! No doubt, Dave Brown is gonna go 95, 96 yards, touchdown! Seattle posted its third shutout of the year beating Kansas City 45 to nothing on the strength of additional interception runbacks for touchdowns by Easley and Keith Simpson. And after Dave Brown struck again, pro football history had been made. Wing left for Kansas City, back as Blackledge gets blitz, he lets one fly down the left side, kicked off the 40 yard line, Brown on his way up the sideline again, they'll never get him! Down the sidelines, Dave Brown, touchdown Seahawks! Well, that'll do it. The Seahawks defense goes into the record books. Four interceptions returned for touchdowns. All the of them. Seahawks defense, the most larcenous defense in the NFL. In 1984, the kingdom rocked with the ear-splitting noise of football's most enthusiastic fans, so devoted that no distance was too great to keep them from being the Seahawks' greatest ally. I moved up here from South Carolina because I'm a Seahawks fan. Had to be close to the Seahawks. I travel 1,800 miles just to see the Seahawks every weekend. Where are you from? Cordova, Alaska. The crowd has a lot to do with, you know, us winning here. They were unbelievable. We have the greatest fans in the nation. There's no doubt about that. Anytime you win, especially playing it here with the Seattle Seahawks, our crowd is at least 25% of our victory. The largest, noisiest crowd in Seahawk history gave their team all the support it needed as Seattle beat the Raiders in mid-November on Monday Night Football. While the defense forced six turnovers, the Seahawk passing game was in peak form. First and 10 at the 20, Craig, a play fake, back to pass in the end zone, touchdown Seahawks! What a pass, Dave Craig just moved. Dave Craig is the type of player who will do anything to win. And in 1984, he did a little of everything to win. I think I have a little bit more confidence, but in the same respect, I'm not gonna change the way that I am or the way that I go out and practice or play during the games because it took me four 
four years of hard work to get to this position, I want to stay here. In 1984, Craig shouldered the offensive load, took charge, and matured into the complete quarterback. Only Miami's Dan Marino threw for more touchdowns than Craig's 32. Dave passed for at least one score in every game he played. He shattered team records and made the Pro Bowl. And he did all this, even though opponents knew the Seahawks would be throwing on nearly every down. Fortunately, there were quality pass targets like Darrell Turner, number 81, a long striding rookie who averaged 20 yards per catch and grabbed 10 touchdowns. While young Turner gave Seattle its best deep threat ever, defenses in the middle zone were being carved up by the precise patterns of the old maestro. Steve Largent was at it again. Largent's statistics were business as usual. 74 catches, 12 touchdowns, another Pro Bowl appearance, and a fistful of clutch grabs that earned the Seahawks important victories. By November, Seattle's passing game had taken shape and was carrying the offensive burden. In no game did the Seahawks' aerial power contribute more than in a late season first place showdown in Denver against the Broncos. Charlie on the tight end lines up on the right as Craig drops back the pass. He's going deep up the left side. He's got Turner in front. He makes the grab of the 30. He's on his way. He'll go all the way. Touchdown, Seahawks. Seattle's 80-yard bomb on the very first play silenced the crowd and forced Denver to respect the home run ball. This gave Steve Blargent all the operating room he needed to destroy the Broncos underneath while setting team records for receptions and yardage. Behind perfect protection, Craig passed for 400 yards and three scores. And when a late Bronco rally failed, Seattle won 27 to 24 to join Denver atop the AFC West standings. But three weeks later in the rematch that would decide the Western title, it was the Broncos who prevailed. The Seahawks still made the playoffs with a 12 and four record, their best ever. But now they faced the wild card round and a tough opponent the defending world champion Raiders. On December 22nd in the AFC wildcard game, the Seahawks and their fans turned up the kingdom decibels, determined to dethrone the champion Raiders, a feat few observers expected would happen. Margin out wide to the left. Craig on a little play fake back. The pass goes for it all in the end zone. Touchdown! Seattle defense had bludgeoned the Raiders. And when Pro Bowl kicker Norm Johnson added two field goals to make it 13 to nothing, the Seahawks' strategy was clear. Chuck Knox all but wrapped up his eventual Coach of the Year honors by ignoring the pass and returning to his first love, the running game. 
Instead of throwing into the Raiders' strength, their pass defense, the Seahawks proceeded to do what the experts said they couldn't, run the ball right down the Raiders' throat. With the offensive line of Blair Bush, Edwin Bailey, Robert Pratt, Ron Essing, and Bob Prider leading the way, Seattle runners David Hughes and Dan Dornick rushed for over 200 yards. The Seahawks effectively kept the ball out of the Raiders' hands until it was too late. And when a crucial third down play was converted late in the game, the world champs were finished. High formation backs, Dornick gets the handoff, breaks through, first down as he gets to the midfield stripe and goes flying into Raider territory to the 47. The Raiders are going down! They're going down! With just seconds to go, L.A. had one final chance, but the Seahawks turned them back. Flop it back to pass. In trouble, he looks. He's going to crank up, throw a deep bomb down the right side. There are a couple of Raiders there. Picked up by Seattle at the 45. Down the field where the football goes easily. Ball game over. Seahawks win it. Seattle 13, L.A. Raiders 7. This game, like the entire season, was a testament to a team that had overcome setbacks to achieve success. It was a tribute to Seattle's loyal fans who had given all their love to a team that had played with all its heart.